Okay, we will get started. Um, I'm going to, um, if, if you may have noticed on the Google Drive page for the class that I put a new schedule, I think I'm going to revise it yet again. Uh, I think I'm going to I'm going to finish up uh, the state estimation on on Tuesday. Um, homework 7, here's the great news that I'm sure you've all been uh, wondering about. Now this has to do with OPF and so there's a there's a section on running the DC OPF including some a test with some security constraints and then the AC OPF and uh, looking at the differences on, on a similar system so here we're going to do uh, we're going to use a 12 bus system for the DC OPF test and then the AC OPF here we'll use the 12 bus case and here we're going to use the 6 bus case and we're also going to run the, the DC on the 6 bus case, the exact same case, it's the same spreadsheet in fact so for both AC and the DC and to compare them, whereas this one is the 12 bus and we're going to do uh, several different uh, tests uh, on here um, one test where there's no no constraints binding the next test uh, you have some line limits as we reduce one of the line maximums and then we're going to do the uh, the the uh, uh, contingency uh, cases so that you'll see it putting contingency limits and you're going to be looking at the um, locational marginal prices in both of them okay uh, so um, today I'm going to to, uh, to start uh, uh, back with state estimation. Remember last time that we to review very quickly. Uh, we showed that that we wanted to use something called weighted least squares. Okay. Which, which says that um, I form a function j uh, and it goes from 1 i equals 1 to the number of measurements so for each measurement I get the measurement value zi this is the measurement value minus f sub i of, of x, that's our state variable, and this is the this is the, uh, the variable as a function of x, of, of, of the state variables and we, we divide this by sigma i, the so-called standard deviation for that particular measurement, and we square it, and that's that's what we what we end up wanting to do is minimize this and this was the first state estimator it it stood it stood uh, uh, in in I guess you could say it stood in uh, in in good um, reputation uh, for many years until until and here, here is the problem. Um, and and I, I ran into this myself in the in the estimator. I was part of a project, and we built a state estimator for the uh, public service electric and gas company in Newark, New Jersey, and it covered most of northern New Jersey, but it had parts of its model that covered the rest of New Jersey and Pennsylvania you could see lines going into New York City and so forth under the Hudson River. Well, here's, 
here's, uh, here's a problem. In the power system, um, you may get, I love just, just this simple, um, you may get a model or, or a part of the system where I have a bus and I have, um, let's just put some, some, some line flows on here, but this, this bus has no generation and it has no load. So it's been dubbed a zero injection bus. And the zero, the zero injection bus presents us with a problem. Um, it, it's an interesting problem. Um, we know the value of P injection and Q injection perfectly. P injection equals zero as well as Q injection. So if I were to put a load there, I could say, well, the load has zero P and Q. Uh, another way of saying this is that if I if I did a if I put a load on here and I put a measurement on that load, I could say that sigma for a zero injection load equals what? 10 to the minus 15, 10 to the minus 20. Uh, I could say essentially it's zero. I know the value of that load to be zero. Therefore, I, I don't have any any qualms in putting in a number like 10 to the minus 15, even though a normal measurement might be 10 to the minus 1, 0 0.1, 0 0.05, something like that. Many, many, many orders of magnitude closer to zero uh, for sigma. Now, the problem with that, the problem with that is, is as follows. Um, if I can get my <coughs> my papers in order here. Um, the, the problem with this is the the following that that. Uh, when we form the, the matrix, when we form our, our matrix, uh, re remember that we form a matrix. Uh, let's see if we get this back so you can see the whole page. Remember that we, we solve this, this equation. We say X estimate is H transpose R inverse H inverse H transpose R inverse Z. This is the measurements here. This is the X measurement. And the, the, real, the real culprit, the real problem here is this matrix. This matrix. Okay. Um, and what, what I'm going to do is talk about a little example. I put an example in, in the textbook um, as follows. It's our little three bus system again. But, in this time, I said, okay, there's a load out here, and there's a measurement there, and there's a measurement there. I didn't want to go adding a fourth measurement. So I just changed it like this. And this is theta 3 equals 0. This is bus 3, 2, 1. And we're going to have a generator here, and we're going to have a load here. And we're going to we're going to say, well, in, in, in reality, uh, the, the actual 
flows. The actual powers are 100 megawatts in here, 100 out here, and this will split um, 70, 20. I think I've got this right in, if I've got that stuck into my, uh, my brain. Um, Um, I'm sorry, 70, 30. So this should be 30. This should be 70. So it just splits and rejoins over here. So th that's because this one, zero. Zero load. Or we can say our, our term, zero injection. Okay. There's no load. Now, what, what, what on earth, let's go back, what on earth do you have zero injection, but why put the bus there? Well, th that's a, that's a good, good question. Um, you may put the, you may put a bus work there, uh, because you're, you're going to bring one line in and have two lines going out, but you have no load or generation there. Uh, so it's still zero injection. Um, and, the two two things can come up um, if you have a zero injection bus when you solve it with uh, with this this matrix h transpose r inverse h inverse which is nearly singular it's it's nearly singular in fact if you form the matrix and I, I did it with uh, sigma one. This is this is. Uh, let's just say sigma. This is one two here. Um, would be 0 0.01. Sigma three two is 0 0.01. And sigma uh, load uh, one up there was. Let's say ten to the minus ten. Okay. I mean I'm gonna. I know that that's zero, and so I'm because I, I know it's zero, I'm going to put a very small sigma in there. Well, re remember now that that's, that R, okay, is sigma 1, 2, sigma 3, 2, and sigma, we'll put this one down here, load 1. So we get 10. 10 to the minus, what is this, 2, 10 to the minus 2, 10 to the minus 10. And then uh, we, we start from, actually, this is, this is uh, squared. So this is really 10 to the minus 4, minus 4, minus uh, 20. Huge difference, H enormous difference. Anybody that's ever played with uh, computers knows that if you try to add two numbers together that are have enormous magnitude differences, um, things go haywire. You you get uh, and that partly that's because the computer, even with double precision, does not have enough precision uh, to take a number that's got decimals way trailing off to the 20th place and adding and subtracting them with numbers that are only only uh, you know the decimals are much, are much bigger up here so when I do this this multiply h transpose r inverse h well r inverse then is gets 10 to the fourth 10 to the fourth and 10 to the 20th you now have a matrix that went, and, and literally when you put it in MATLAB, you'll get an error message that comes back and says, this matrix is nearly singular. It, it will often, MATLAB is nice, it'll go ahead and try to do, try to do the, uh, the multiplier, the inverse, whatever you want to do. Um, but it recognizes right away that it being close to singular, it, uh, it's going to warn you. And essentially, you, you can put the words, uh, you, can, you, you can say, well, if it warns you, then at that point and everything beyond is junk. 
it's no good. There's no point in continuing. So, um, what what is the result? Result of zero injection and 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 I'm going to put buses here because we have many of them. Um, we have many of them on, on power systems. Um, the, the, the system at Public Service Electric and Gas had, had buses like this and when I solved it with the weighted least squares uh, it, would, it would conclude that there was a little bit of load there and it would proceed to take that amount of load and say that that was, that was the load at that bus. But then later on, when we were going to transfer the state estimator to, to a power flow, well, the load, the load is gone. Okay, I'll just draw it here and just put an X. The load is gone. And when I, as soon as I do that, that amount of load has to be supplied or is, is, is something extra coming out of the reference bus. And so we would solve the state estimator we would get all these little loads, and we'd notice that when we did the power flow, the reference bus was was uh, had a, had a uh, you know a, a silly kind of a large number on it. So that was one effect. The, the other effect, frankly, is simply that if you if you try to put something in here, uh, you can't do it with this. But even even up, you know, you said, well, let's say ten to the minus six. Or ten to the minus eight. You once you you get it to a certain point, it's it's gonna blow up, and the the solution itself is no good. So people didn't recognize this when they first did weighted least squares. They started writing state estimators. They put them into power company offices and computers. Began to look at the the results and. Um, knew that we had a problem. So we we had to correct this and the solution was a different algorithm and there were some people, some sharp people doing doing research, actually a couple of uh, uh, academics, professors at the University of Waterloo in Canada, which is a very good technical uh, university. Um, and so they, 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 they said, well, you know, what you need to do, what you need to use is the, uh, an algorithm called orthogonal decomposition. And the orthogonal decomposition um, algorithm overcomes the difficulties uh, of, of having that nearly singular matrix. And so what, what, let's, let's start out and we'll say, okay, R inverse, I'm going to make it into the product of two, two matrices, R to the minus one times R to the um, one half, R to the minus one half. And so this, this says now, this is 1 over sigma 1, 1 over sigma 2, etc. And the same thing here. Okay. So then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to break up H transpose R inverse H becomes H transpose R to the minus 1 half, R to the minus 1 half H. And this this can be uh, if, if you if you look at it, I've got two matrices here. This this side is the transpose of that, so I'm just going to call this H prime transpose H prime, where H prime is simply equal to R to the minus one half H. Fairly simple. I've now. Uh, I, I'm doing this to kind of rid myself of, uh, of the R. I don't want to carry it all through the calculation, so I just 
I go back and I, I multiply it into the, and what this means is I multiply each row of h by 1 over sigma. Um, and then it turns out that x estimate is h transpose prime h, or h prime, and I, I don't like the fact that MATLAB uses a prime to indicate transpose, so but that's the that's the notation that uh, we're we're kind of stuck with, and then this is h prime transpose z prime, where z prime is again r to the minus one half times the z. Uh, so I I put another uh, r r inverse, uh, pardon me, r to the minus one half times r to the minus one half in here, and I moved it back to these two terms. So so now. I have I have a matrix equation that looks like this. Now, in I'm I'm not going to go into all of the theory of how this is done. That's in the textbook, but but for the sake of our problem session, and then I'll I'll show you some results of what happens when you do this. We're going to say h prime. I'm going to I'm going to do whatever I have to to get it into this form. Now, remember that h and h or h prime has dimensions like this. Uh, number of measurements, number of states. And usually this is uh, number of measurements is greater than the number of states. So it's 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 a matrix that's taller than it is wide. Okay, it's got more rows than columns. That's maybe a better way to say it. More rows than columns. It's a tall, thin <laughs> matrix. Well, Q is number of measurements by number of measurements, then this u is number of measurements by number of states. Okay, so Q, u, u still is tall and thin, whereas this is, this is square and it's got the number of measurements like that. Um, furthermore, I am going to uh, use an algorithm now uh, where I'm going to say that the, the result of the algorithm says that Q transpose times Q is the identity matrix. Okay? 1, 1, 1, 1 with everything else zeros. They call this an orthogonal matrix. Remember, orthogonal also implies two, two lines that are orthogonal are, are uh, perpendicular to each other 90 degrees. Um, and two matrices, uh, when you multiply one times the other, you get the, you get an identity matrix of the same dimension. Um, that's an orthogonal matrix. Well, that's interesting. Um, and then U will have a, a form U1. Let's say I have two states, 1, 2, and U2, 2, and everything else will be 0. So what it'll be is it'll be a, a matrix of number of states, and then I have a, some rows, number of states, and the rest of the matrix is zero. So I take this little triangle, triangular piece off the top, everything else below it is zero. So I'm I'm saying that I can I can work H prime to equal Q times U. Okay, h prime is equal to q times u, where this is this is a matrix that's that's orthogonal, and this one has terms, you know, that's that's like this, where everything else is zero. Um, the the other way of of writing this is to call this. Sometimes you will see the term h prime is equal to qr. That's more 
common mathematically, and they will actually call it the QR algorithm. Um, where we will see that is the actual code that we use in MATLAB, they call it QR. So um, we'll see that in a minute. I'm going to show you some code. And so they, they use the term QR because that's that's the more that's the, the common mathematician's uh, algorithm uh, to call it uh, QR. But we like Q times U. Okay, we like Q times times U. It's a little more uh, familiar. Now, um, then what I what I'm gonna show then is um, well let let's in 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 uh, we're now going to say x e s t is equal to let's go back to the h prime transpose h prime inverse times um, h prime transpose z prime all right now, I, I said H prime, remember, H prime is QU. So, transpose, this comes out, U transpose, Q transpose, this one uh, becomes QU. I got an inverse out here. This one becomes uh, U transpose Q transpose and this is just whatever z prime z prime is is z multiplied by r to the minus one half and this looks like i've made the problem much more complicated but in fact if you look back here that uh i have a matrix times because we know that q transpose times q is equal to i which is the identity so i can just say well then this is u transpose u inverse u transpose uh, q transpose z prime and um, we're going to say that uh, q transpose z prime is equal to z hat okay so now uh, I'm going to take this inverse here and I'm going to Get, move it over to the other side so that I have u transpose u times x estimate is simply equal to u transpose z hat or tilde sometimes that's called a tilde so I've simplified it down to, to this to this part but but notice that that now I have u u transpose on both sides so therefore, u x estimate is equal to z hat. Well, and this is in a very nice form. It's in a very nice form, which which we call upper triangular. So let's let's. It's got terms like this. It's got let's say a zero, then two zeros. If I had three state variables, and then everything else is zero. And I have I have state variables, but I only have x1 in this case x2 x3, and that is equal to now I have I have a bunch of z's, and they go they go on down, but I don't care at anything about the ones down here. I care about these. Once I have this form, the the, the you start solving for it by solving for x3 equals z3 divided by u33 and then so now I know x3 so so the formula for x uh, um, x2 times u1 uh, let's see this is 2 2 uh, plus um, x3 times u23 is equal to z2 but I already know x2, so there I'm 
I'm sorry, x3. So x2 is 1 over u22 times z2 minus uh, x3 u23. So I've solved for this one, then I went up and solved for this, and I solved for them in reverse order. And I can write x1 u11 plus x2 u12 plus x3 u13 equals z1. And then I can solve for x1 is 1 over u1 times z1 minus x2 u12 minus x3 u13. So I can, I can solve boom, boom, in reverse order. This is the, the, the process of, uh, of it's, it's sim simply called back substitution. Um, it's a way of solving equations. The way you solve the, any, any, any set of linear equations, if you just want the solution, you, you form a triangularization by, by doing operations to drive these to zero, and then you solve it backwards, uh, like this, called back substitution. So I, I have a very simple solution now. Um, all I have to do is, is get u, and, I, and I'm all done. Well, in uh, here I'm going to... Jump over here to, um, to my com computer output, which I just yanked off the... The printer here. So we'll, we'll give you this program uh, next time to, to work with. Um, let, let's, let's just show you what happened with a regular weighted least squares. So here be uh, page 5. Um, so this is a result of weighted least squares. So we're going to have to inverse h transpose r inverse h inverse and as i as i said and i'm 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 running the the r values so uh, at um, r remember is 1 over sigma squared uh, would be 10 to the minus 4 10 to the minus 4 and 10 to the minus whatever let's say 10 to the minus 20 or something like this down here um, when you go to solve it, there's MATLAB saying warning matrix is close to singular and badly scaled. Um, results may be inaccurate. Uh, this, this, there's, a, there's a thing called the condition number that you can calculate. In, and uh, this condition number is 10 to the minus 6, e to the minus 16. Uh, uh, this is the, the line in the MATLAB code, and when you go to when you go to do something with it, um, uh, you you can't you can't go forward. You can't solve anything. Um, this was this little three bus system with uh, a zero a zero injection. So um, then we have a, a QR program here. So. Let's call this page six. Um, here's here's my H matrix here, um, and down here I form my R, and then, then here's here's uh, forming H prime, and uh, here's uh, here is the the point. You see it down here. It says. Q U equals Q R. That's the name, that's the MATLAB subroutine of H prime. So you just simply put the matrix in here and call and it returns Q and U, of which uh, we'll show later on that we do we do, do something with uh, with uh, uh, Q. We have to we have to go back and, and uh, estimate the flows and things like that, but it just does it for us, it does that for us. Um, it, there are several different ways of getting the Q and the U to try to, different ways to try to preserve the, uh, 
the overall accuracy. So um, that's uh, that's how our our algorithm works. Um, we we um, uh, and and I'm going to give you some homework problems. Uh, I, I indicated homework seven has to do with OPF. Homework eight will have to do state estimate, and you will get some you will get some routines to to try out the, to try this out and. Uh, uh, doing such things as okay, try the weighted least squares and keep keep changing the 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 sigma on the on the zero injection bus until the thing blows up. Okay, so that's uh, that's coming. Um, so now I'm gonna I'm gonna switch topics. One of the one of the things that I wanted to get into. Um, I'm, I'm going to, next week, Tuesday, I, I will cover uh, bad data, how, how we do bad data detection uh, and so forth. That will be covered next week. But I'm going to talk about a, another topic. Um, I had the good fortune in the 1970s, early 80s, to be working with uh, a fellow who named Kevin, Kevin Clements, who is a professor at Worcester Polytechnic Institute in, in Massachusetts, in Worcester, uh, Worcester, Massachusetts, is Worcester Poly, WPI, um, and he he was a brilliant fellow at at. Statistics, probability, signal processing, and he understood this 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 problem. So here I'm going to, I'm going to show you a problem. It's called observability. If you have taken a course in control theory, then the word observability may may be familiar to you. Uh, control theorists said um, we have to have a certain set of measurements and if we don't have a complete set of measurements then we cannot determine the states of the system. They worked out all of all the mathematics of this way back when in the 60s and 70s or maybe earlier. But along we came with the state estimation problem and here I'm going to give you this a very very simple example. I have a three bus system. It just has two lines. I have a generator here. This we will call the reference. This is bus one. Here's bus two. Here's bus three. So this is one, two, and three. We'll say that theta one equals zero, zero degrees. And we will say that um, that we, we actually measure theta one. Well, I don't need to measure it, but um, I can have a measurement on here for uh, PG1. So this is PG1 coming in here, and I have a measurement in, in here for this. PG1 measurement, and then I have another measurement, which is the measurement for flow from 1 to 2. Um, I'm going to have another generator down here on this bus, and over here I'm going to have a load. Uh, <clears throat> small but respectable power system, two generators and a load. The problem is that I know what this generator is putting out. I know what this flow is. That's all I know. That's all I know. Um, with either of these measurements or both, let's just take the M12. I can say uh, M12 gives me flow 1, 2, which is 1 over x1, 2, theta 1 minus theta 2. Well, we already know that theta 1 is equal to 0. So therefore, and, and, and this is some value that I know, because that's the measured value, and I, I, I want to determine theta 2, so in that case, theta 2 is minus um, 
flow 1 2 times x 1 2 to solve it for theta 2. So that says that I've, I've got theta 1 and I now have theta 2. I can solve for that. The terminology is to say I observe. I can observe the value of x2 because I have this measurement. All, all that observing set, it means is that I, I know what the value of x2 is. That's observing it. However, however, I don't know p gen 2. Uh, I don't know. And p load. Let's say p load 3. I don't know. And therefore, the worst part about this is theta 3 is completely unknown. So we say it's unobservable. I can't determine the value of theta 3 because I don't I don't have enough measurements. Now, it, you could look at this and you could say, well, look, uh, I'll put them in green. Um, if, if I were to put a measurement here, that would measure the flow from 2 to 3, bingo, I'd have a, I'd have a, a way of getting theta 3. I could put, um, I could put a, a, a P gen here. Because then I could calculate the flow coming into the bus plus what the generator is, then I would know the flow going out. So having the generator is the same as having this flow. So that would give it to me. If, if I put a measurement here, it doesn't do me any good because it just gives me another value for M12. But, but these two would allow me to extend it. And of course, if I measured this one here, I could get it. So... If, if I just had one more measurement, then the entire network would be observable. Now, what happens? Well, this is what Kevin Clements discovered. This is what we, what we, uh, we worked this out and we wrote a, a paper on it. It turns out that if the, if the uh, measurements, the measurement set is unobservable, then H transpose R inverse H, forgetting zero injections, is singular. There's no solution. No solution to the state estimator. You're, you're dead in the water. You don't know. You can't find the value of this, this theta down here. So, what are you supposed to do? Well, this is the, the terminology. Um, and and the, the original people that developed these things, they said, well, we would add a pseudo measurement. What, what is a pseudo measurement? Well, it's it's not a real measurement. <laughs> it's not a it's not a measurement, and I just put a value someplace. Well, if if you look at this thing up here, um, maybe this generator, maybe I know that it's generating so much because it generates that much all the time anyway. I don't measure it; it's not a measurement, but I know what the p is. Or uh, so so p gen two can be a pseudo measurement um, simply knowing uh, PG2 by some other by some other means. So PG2 can be a pseudo measurement. Or P load 3 can be a pseudo measurement simply by having um, by from historical data. Uh, what, which is what we call a load forecast. Meaning, I've kept, I've kept records of what that, historically, what that load uh, exhibits on 
let's see, it's Thursday afternoon at 4.45. Uh, I can tell within a few megawatts what the value of that, that load is. And so we simply say then that we will, we will add a pseudo measurement. And I, I like the idea of basing it on a survey um, as opposed to just guessing. So now I have a, let, let's, just, let's just draw it like this. And I have this measurement and I have that one, but they only get me theta 1 and theta 2, and I can't go any further. Uh, let's, and, and so what we're going to do now is we're going to say, ah, I have this one down here. And this is a, a pseudo measurement based on a forecast, which is based on historical data. As soon as I put that measurement into it, the mathematics doesn't care where this thing came from. I now can get theta 3, and now I can solve the state estimator. Now, what happens is, is that you say the sigma for a pseudo is what? Is larger. It says I... I don't... I, you know, maybe it's an order of magnitude or two orders of magnitude larger than a, an actual physical measurement. And there's a lot of uh, talk about the fact that a pseudo measurement, can it, can it corrupt? The answer is no, it can't corrupt these two, but whatever value we put here is going to directly affect theta 3. And therefore, when I go back to solve the flow on this line, and the output of this generator, it's going to be affected by any errors on that pseudo. Well, the pseudo could be off by quite a bit because it's a forecast. Suppose the load on that bus is much different for a Thursday afternoon at 4.46 like it is right now. Then it's, it's much different than my forecast. Well, then I get a big error. Uh, I get a big error. So... Uh, you can you, you can you can imagine that that well wh why is this important? <clears throat> well, measurements drop out. That's what, that's what happens. Um, measurements can drop out, or uh, measurements can be bad, in which case it's it's taken out meaning from our perspective we don't use it and if you don't use it you lose some observability if the measurement drops out now the, the dropout is either uh, a device fail or communications fail um, power systems are spread over hundreds if not thousands of miles and communications um, uh, can can drop out the electronics that uh, transmits the, the the signals back and forth can suddenly go bad. The device at the substation itself doing the measuring can go bad. So what we need to do then is we need to take a model of the system. A model of our power system, and then we need to take a uh, a, a a database with measurement data, and we need to know which measurements are working, are working connected, whatever you want to say, which measurements are working, and and taking that. I do what's called an observability test. Observability test, and and I do have, I have a, I have a, a, an, a, a program that that can do that. Pardon me. Should so we take our model of our system, 
we take a database with the measurement data and the measurement we know we have to know which measurement what's the status of each measurement is it connected is the device working is it considered good as a communication etc cetera, etc cetera. and then knowing the, what what measurements are in and what are out I do an observability test on the model with those measurements and and if it's not observable and the answer is not observable then we will add automatically we will add pseudo measurements and Kevin Clements uh, went on with a graduate student at Worcester Poly to write some brilliant papers that described how you minimize the effect of the bad of, of the messiness of the pseudo measurements uh, on the rest of the uh, the uh, 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 state estimate, uh, it literally forms islands of uh, of observable buses and islands where I can't tell what the buses are, and then you 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 put in an obser a pseudo measurement to try to connect the islands, and we'd like to put in the minimum number of pseudo measurements, and he he and his student worked out the theory of of how to do that. Um, and and I would say Kevin Clement's methodology is one of the one of the bases for the way commercial state estimators do their job for power systems. So that's the the problem. And we will give you some uh, some simple uh, homework problems that say and, and, and maybe hint hint even on a test you'll get a little. A little network with some measurements and ask is it or isn't it observable and where to put a pseudo measurement to make it observable. So that's one of the uh, observability tests that's one of the things that has to be done because if you don't you're not going to get a result. The state estimator will not work. Even, even the QR algorithm will not solve if it's not observable if it's not observable and what you want is you want a program that uh, based on Clement's method that that will tell you exactly what buses are observable and what buses are not all right the other the other fantastic development that came along in uh, the 1980s let's say um, we had a speaker um, uh, a few years ago, but there, there's a professor at Virginia Polytechnic Institute, a friend of mine named, named Aaron Fadke, and he and his, his graduate student, Centino, uh, did a lot of the original work on, on what are called PMUs. A PMU is a phaser, phaser measurement unit, um, and it it does not. There's no such thing as phase angle absolute. I can only measure the phase angle. So if I have theta one here and theta two, and I'm I'm used to just doing that and saying this is equal to zero. What I can measure directly, if I have something here and something here, is I can re I can measure theta two minus theta one. Okay, I can measure the difference. And what what do I mean by theta one? And it comes down to if I have a and I say let's say this is bus A and this is bus B. Here's Here's angle A, and it's it's going to be zero because the cosine wave uh, or the sine wave is going to cross at zero. And so we know theta theta one is zero. I shouldn't have, I should let let me let me call this bus one. Bus one. Um, bus two. So here's bus one here. Okay. So th this is theta one, and then. I've got this 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 other thing that comes like this, and this is bus 
2. And the, what we need to measure is the time difference, delta t. So until, let's say, roughly the 1970s, 1980s, there was no way to do this. But now we have what are called GPS satellites. And so if we, if we have a substation here, here's, here's um, substation 1 and substation 2, and I've got, I've got a, a satellite up here. We'll, we'll put some antenna on it. And I've got, uh, I got a signal coming down there, and I've got a signal coming down over here. And I know precisely where the substations are, geographically located. And I can measure, I can measure a time signal, and I can measure the, the time difference between these. So I can measure theta 2 minus theta 1. And if I assume theta 1 is 0, then I have effectively measured the phase angle out here. Well, it, turned out, it turns out that this is, this is a fantastic development for, for, for many reasons. For one thing, we can, theta 2 measurement can go right into the state estimator. Now, I have heard people say, we won't need, we won't need conventional state estimators anymore, we'll just measure them. Uh, and, and by the way, um, the other thing that, that this thing does is that you, you've got, a, you've got a, a thing like this, and you're sampling, not nearly, much, much more than this one. So you're taking samples in, in the substation, and therefore you can predict what the magnitude of the voltage is up here and you you can predict where it hits its peak so you can, you can call that t1 and then you've got another one over here that you're sampling on the other substation and you get t2 and so you get you get a time difference uh, and knowing the difference that they are geographically you can back out the calculation of the phase angle difference so I got I get a very accurate uh, measurement of V and theta at buses with these GPS units. Um, they're not perfect uh, any, any more than any other measurement is perfect. But these tend to be a little more accurate, much, much more accurate. Um, but it doesn't mean you can replace the state estimator because you, you'd have to have a GPS unit that's attached to every bus and and it's easy to to think of uh, buses that um, let's see if, if I have a ah, come on. if I have a bus so suppose I have a bus uh, comes comes in here I have two lines coming in here and two lines coming in here well, we can have what's called a ring bus. That's a breaker. That's a breaker. That's a breaker. And this is a breaker. It's a very simple ring bus. Um, if, if, if this line faults, then I can open these two breakers, and I still have these three lines connected together through these two breakers, etc. Uh, this is why they, they call us a ring bus. It's a whole, you can see it in the beginning chapter of our book on power flow where we talk about ring buses and breaker and a half and so forth and so forth. Um, if, you, if you split the bus, so suppose we, we in, instead we, we, um, we indicate that this breaker and this breaker is open well, then, then we have uh, essentially buses that look like this without drawing the breakers that I've split it. Well, if that's the case, then I have to have a GPS measurement here 
and a GPS measurement on every single what we call bus section inside that ring bus. Four of them. I gotta have four of them hooked up. Um, maybe they'll get there someday, but they're not there by now. Uh, for, furthermore, um, the GPS measurements are, are, are brought back using a wide area network. They don't just bring them back with telephone grade communications. Um, ultimately, they may hook up the, the measurement system for a large power grid where every substation is connected to every other substation using uh, fiber optics or something like that and, and, and you've got uh, local area network. Uh, lots of people can tell you what the advantages of that would be. But here's, here's another thing. Um, advantage of PMUs. Remember that's phase angle measurement unit. Um, I can watch phase angle change. Or more, more importantly, if it starts to oscillate. So if you have if you have a measurement, and you know you have a phase angle theta, and um, it's it's sitting here and it's just doing, and all of a sudden it starts to do this, and the oscillations get bigger and bigger, you probably have an instability in the power system. You have a power system that's going unstable, or that it's it's at least it's it's uh, it's progressing in a bad way. <laughs> And you can you can literally watch this. You can put this on a on a computer monitor and watch it because you're you're sampling it so fast. This was this was absolutely unbelie unbelievably uh, wonderful for people. And what modern control systems are doing now is they're putting phase angle measurements and and uh, that this is especially meaningful in the United States in the western part where they have generators and substations that are long distances apart, hundreds of miles if not thousands. And that leads to power systems that can, can get into trouble by oscillating. And um, so they, they, they do a bunch of phase angle measurements across the system and they look at the phase angle you might have a phase angle, uh, let's say, in uh, in the state of Washington at some place on the Bonneville power uh, system, and then look at the phase angle uh, over in uh, California, the phase angle over in Montana, or down in uh, Colorado, etc. And if you see any of those phase angles, and you you literally show it on the screen, uh, maybe they do some signal processing of this and try to alarm it to the operator but it's a it's a it's a wonderful tool uh, in in that way yeah, which is nothing to do essentially with state estimation but it but it gives you more information about the system than you would have by a, a measurement the, the standard state estimator might sample um, and re-execute the state estimator at, at let's say a two second would be would be possible. There's a, there's some measurements that come in every couple seconds on a power system, maybe a little more often, but nothing nothing that can do this. So this is a this is a of uh, great use. But once again, we can put V magnitude measurement, and we can put theta measurement uh, into. Uh, the state estimator. It helps tremendously. The, the theta measurement it helps tremendously with observability. That 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 part has been uh, has been brought out by a lot of people. Um, most electric companies have not said, "Okay, we're going to put a GP uh, a, a PMU unit." 
that covers every single bus section in every major bus and every substation, etc., etc. Uh, they're, they're putting them judiciously around their system uh, because they're expensive. They are expensive to put in, but uh, they do have, uh, do have that uh, advantage. Okay, well, next time um, I'm going to jump into the, to the topic. I'll, I'll start it a, a little bit. Um, notes on it here. Um, remember I said the other day, uh, Tuesday this week, that that the state estimator, we, we, we could tell two things. We could, we could detect, oh, come on, spell it right, detect bad data and identify the bad measurement. So this, this just says, hey, you got a bad measurement someplace. And the other one says, it's this measurement in this substation. And then when you have identified it, you go fix it. Okay, we just put, put those simple words. Go fix it. Um, probably you send technicians out, they go and they pull out the old electronics and put a new, a new set in and bring it back and maybe recalibrate it or, or literally replace uh, the parts of the print circuit board that are bad, whatever. So we, we go fix it and that, that helps guarantee that we always are using uh, working uh, measurements. And um, once again, you know, last time I said a really good, a really good measurement will have a, a, a distribution that's, that's really close to the, to the, to the actual value, whereas a, a not so good measurement will be scattered all around and it'll have a distribution that looks like this. Small, Sigma large Sigma okay so the next thing that uh, we want to do is work out the uh, the statistical um, reasoning and we remember back that we have this value J is the sum of zi minus fi of x divided by sigma i squared. So again, it's the sum of squares. Well, the zi are the ones that have the errors, okay? So this is, this is the error. The errors come in through the measurements. <coughs> the f, the f, <coughs> F is um, the function of the model. You, you can have errors from the model. Uh, in the book we talk about uh, the sources of error are the transducers, the model, communications, and so forth. Um, mostly right now we're concerned about the, the The errors in the measurement transducer, the device that does the measuring itself. We want to get rid of that error. And so, um, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to say, well, how, how do we get, uh, how do we, did we determine, first of all, if there is bad data? And what we, what we need to know is, um, uh, what is the probability density function. Now here we get, you, you've got to get in, whoop, or PDF of J. 
PDF is the is the function that that says well what what uh, what determines how we can do this uh, this detection and I've got to know well what what does what happens with this value of J and what we'll do next week uh, I'm, I'm not going to carry much further here but next but next week Tuesday we'll we'll cover the fact that J has a certain distribution. Um, J has a distribution called a a chi a chi squared PDF, and there's a you can look up the tables of this, you can look up formulas for it, etc. Um, and the, the the values, the numbers that you get in there, um, are determined by what's called the number of degrees of freedom. I just might as well keep going here. The, the degrees of freedom uh, basically are equal to the number of measurements minus the number of states. Number of states. Now in a, in a power system the number of states, you got V and you've got theta, so at a, at a substation, we, we say that's equal to 2 times the number of buses minus 1. Uh, again, we have to assume that one of the phase angles is known to be 0 and everybody else is related to it. This is just equal to the number of measurements around the system. So, the degrees of freedom, um, you want it to be large, and what we'd like to know then is just if we get a if we get a uh, a chi squared distribution, then I can tell you what the what the mean of the chi squared distribution is. It has to do with with this degrees of freedom. Well, then if if the value of j comes out to be very different than that mean, it's it's really way off. Well, then the chances are that I've got a bad measurement. But if, if everybody if everybody is acting the way they should, and, and what I mean by that is if all measurements have an error, remember I used this for the error of normal and sigma, okay? Standard deviation sigma i for, for the measurement uh, and its its error is zero mean, and it has a it has this, the sigma that I put into the state estimator. If they're all if they're all acting good, well then I can predict the, the mean of the the j j number. And if it comes out close enough to that mean, well then I'm okay. Then I then everybody's acting good. It's statistically it says the probability of an error is just not that bad. Well, if, if I get a if I get a value of uh, the mean of j, I get a value of j, and it's way off from that mean. Well, then maybe maybe I have an a, a, an estimate, a, a measurement, whose error is not zero, not zero mean, but it's got some bias. It uh, something went wrong with the electronics, and and it's permanently reading. 20% high, okay? Um, whatever. Uh, in which case, then my the value that I get for the value J is very different. It, and it says there's a good probability that you've got an error. So that's all we want to know. So um, the detection says uh, we want to look at the probability of there being an error on the system. And if it's, if the probability is very small, you better just, then, then we'll say, okay, there's no, there's no bad data. And if the, if the probability says, if that probability that I calculate says it's large, well then there probably is bad data. 
Okay, and we better go look for it. And so the looking for it, the, the identifying is is, a, is another thing. But the but the the initial problem is to say, well, what is the what is the you know where am I? I get a value of j, and if I can say, well, j should be about this much, and it's not, go look for bad data. Okay, so we'll you've now been been given your your hour and a quarter that you paid for your your tuition. I often would tell students, I can't let you go early because you're paying for all this time of uh, of mine and of the university, and uh, and and uh, you'll you'll complain if I let you go early. Actually, I've never had a student who complained that I let the class go early, but uh, it seems to me that I don't want to let you go early so we'll we'll uh, call it uh, call it a day here and we will see you on Tuesday um, the homework will be due a week from tomorrow the homework 7 is posted I will send an email out tonight uh, the homework 7 is posted uh, and that will be due a week from tomorrow okay uh, We'll bid you adieu. I will leave the meeting and bye-bye.